The subcommittee will come to order. Today we're examining the Treasury Department's strangely timed announcement that it's delaying the enforcement of Obamacare's employer mandate for one year. For the last several months, we've heard the White House repeatedly pledge to Congress and the American people that the President's Affordable Care Act will be ready on schedule, absolutely take it to the bank. In fact, Secretary Kathleen Sebelius recently insisted before this very committee that the White House would not miss another Obamacare deadline. Not one, not again. Shortly thereafter, the nation learned in a blog post of the embarrassing failure by the White House to have this major pillar of the new law in place on schedule. The Treasury Department's announcement confirms our concerns. Obamacare is simply not ready. This committee has serious questions about how and, why, how and why this alarming decision was made and the effect that delaying this key provision will have on other provisions of the law, specifically the directive that individuals purchase government-approved health care or pay a tax. There are also questions about the unprecedented manner in which it was announced on an obscure Treasury blog site just two days before the 4th of July holiday. We invited Treasury officials to testify today to explain to the American people the rationale for the delay and how they announced this major setback. However, they declined to appear. Let me be clear, this committee intends to get an explanation and will plan on Treasury officials appearing at a date in the near future. Today we'll hear from five witnesses, Avic Roy, senior fellow from the Manhattan Institute, James Capretta, fellow with the Ethics and Public Policy Center, William Dennis, Jr., Senior Research Fellow at the National Federation of Independent Business, Sean Falk, owner of Wolf Team LLC, and Timothy jo Jost, the Robert, T Robert L. Willett Family Professor of Law at Washington and Lee University School of Law, who's accompanied by his wife, Ruth, today. Uh, Mr. Roy, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Brady. Ranking Member uh, McDermott and members of the Health Subcommittee, thanks for inviting me to speak with you today about the Affordable Care Act employer mandate. My name is Ovik Roy. I'm a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research, in which capacity I conduct research on health care and entitlement reform. In my remarks today, I'll focus on three questions. First, does the employer mandate help the Affordable Care Act achieve its goals? Second, what are the ramifications of the White House's decision to delay the mandate by one year? Third, what would be the policy impact of H.R. 903, the American Job Protection Act, which would repeal the employer mandate in its entirety? While the Affordable Care Act strives to achieve many things, the law's primary goal is to move the United States as close as possible to universal health insurance coverage. Does the employer mandate help to achieve this goal? My view, and the view of many others across the spectrum, is that it does not. According to the Medical Expenditure Panel Survey, 97% of firms with 50 or more workers already offer health benefits. Now, 97% is not 100%, of course, and not all firms that offer coverage offer it to every employee. But the ACA's employer mandate, perversely, incentivizes employers to avoid hiring low-income workers, precisely the type of workers who tend to be uninsured. As the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities put it in 2009, in essence, affected firms would pay a tax for hiring people from low or moderate income families. The penalties associated with the employer mandate are only triggered if a worker is not offered what the ACA deems affordable coverage and if the worker then gains subsidized coverage on an ACA-sponsored insurance exchange. As a result, employers have three incentives. First, to hire fewer full-time workers. Second, to offer so-called unaffordable coverage for which the penalties are lower. Third, to hire illegal immigrants or workers from high-income families who are not eligible for exchange subsidies. Through the Affordable Care Act, low-income individuals would still be able to gain subsidized health insurance but they will be tagged with a scarlet S for gaining those subsidies because to employers, hiring subsidized individuals will be far more costly than hiring unsubsidized ones. A one-year delay of the employer mandate does give the administration more time to implement the law. 
But a delay does not fundamentally alter the perverse incentives that I've just described. It simply gives employers an additional year to restructure their workforces accordingly. A one-year delay does, however, impact other important provisions of the ACA. In order to gain eligibility for exchange subsidies, an individual must prove that he has not been offered, quote unquote, affordable coverage from his employer. But now that the reporting requirements of the employer mandate have been delayed, it may be difficult for him to establish that. Hence, it appears that CMS will rely on applicants' attestations, the so-called honor system, to dispense subsidies in some cases. Similarly, the ACA's individual mandate only works if the government can verify whether or not a worker is full-time or part-time, whether he has been offered affordable or unaffordable coverage, quote-unquote, or none at all. H.R. 903, the American Job Protection Act, is a bipartisan bill that was introduced last February by Dr. Bustani and others and referred to this committee. It would repeal the employer mandate by striking the relevant sections of the Internal Revenue Code and the Affordable Care Act. Repealing the employer mandate would eliminate the perverse incentives I described earlier. Most importantly, it would encourage a transition away from costly, inefficient, employer-sponsored coverage and towards portable, individually-owned insurance policies. As you all know, economists have long advocated for this transition, and repealing the employer mandate would go a long way toward achieving it. In this way, H.R. 903 could emerge as a major policy advance. Some analysts have raised concerns that such a transition would be costly due to the increased spending on exchange subsidies that would result. However, in March 2012, the CBO estimated that if an additional 14 million workers moved from employer-based to exchange-based coverage, the deficit would actually decrease by $13 billion over 10 years. This is because the increase in exchange subsidies is offset by a reduction in lost revenue from the tax exclusion for employer-sponsored insurance. It will be important for H.R. 903 to be adjusted in order to take into account its impact on the disbursement of subsidies and the individual mandate. The individual mandate, for example, could be replaced with a more limited open enrollment period for participating in ACA-certified insurance plans. This would achieve the individual mandate's goal of curbing adverse selection without the mandate's intrusiveness or constitutional injury. I, I will conclude by recalling that Scarlet S. We all want an economy in which those at the bottom of the ladder have the opportunity to find gainful employment and good health care. The employer mandate harms those it is intended to help. Instead of delaying it, we should repeal it. Thanks again for having me. As an addendum to my written testimony, I have included three articles from Forbes in which I further expand on these issues. I look forward to your questions and to being of further assistance to this committee. They made the judgment that the employer system wasn't ready to be enforced in 2014. It's quite obvious to me that the individual mandate is also not ready to be enforced in 2014. And I, I, I would absolutely urge this committee and the Congress to delay. If you're going to delay one, you should delay both. Thank you, Mr. Credit. Mr. Roy, if Obamacare is not ready for businesses, is it ready for our families? You're a health care expert. You know, let's assume it's your family, uh, your child's ill, uh, your spouse needs treatment. Uh, is Obamacare ready for your family, in your opinion? No, I would not only echo uh, Mr. Capretta's points, but I would point out that the cost of coverage on the, uh, the ACA exchanges is going to be much higher than what currently exists in the individual market for health insurance. So not only are we requiring through the individual mandate that individuals and families purchase insurance coverage, we're requiring the buy coverage that in many cases is two to three times the cost of coverage that's available today. So for some, their health care costs will go up dramatically. That's correct. That's right. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, if this isn't a case for the need to simplify government, I don't know what it is. Uh, this law is literally just unraveling before our eyes. I don't know how you can conclude that this is not a total fiasco. We see estimates where anywhere from 20 to 60 million people could have lost their employer-sponsored health insurance over a long period of time and gotten dumped into the exchanges. And so we have the exchanges where we're, as Mr. Roy pointed out, in some cases doubling and tripling the cost of health insurance. So through the regulations, we're imposing much, much higher health insurance costs on people, but we'll subsidize them with taxpayer dollars. So make health insurance more expensive and then subsidize it so it, the, the, the consumer doesn't feel the price as much, 
The taxpayer bears the burden. The employer has a mandate. The employer has a greater incentive to just stop offering health insurance to their employees. Most employers are sitting around the table thinking, well, if my competitor is going to drop health insurance and put their employees in the exchange, all I got to do is pay a $2,000 per person, you know, tax index at inflation versus, you know, 10 to $20,000 a family plan. Once an employer makes that decision, it's not long after that their competitors will have to make the same decision and dump their employees into the exchange and the costs are going to explode. Mr. Johnson walked you through the charade of the pay-fors. I can't see that this, this ruling right here will do nothing more than to further explode the cost of this thing. Um, oh, there's so much more I could get into, but in the interest of time, I won't. Thank you. Let me just you. ask the panel right down the line a simple question. Mr. Roy, what's your recommendation for this uh, Congress? to fully repeal the Affordable Care Act or to fix certain features of it to make it work better? I think that repealing and replacing the Affordable Care Act would be an optimal policy outcome. Mr. Capretto, what's, that, your, what's, that what's your recommendation to the Congress, to fully repeal or to fix? And I'm for repealing and replacing it. I've Mr. Dennis, an what's your recommendation to the Congress? Like. Repeal and replace. Mr. Falk? If it doesn't get replaced enough, repeal it. Mr. Jones? I think that there are some things that need to be fixed, and I think they can be fixed if this Congress would set its mind to that task. You know, my dad probably gave me the best political advice as a young kid growing up. He said, son, you're going to face two critics in life, people who criticize you because they want to see you do better, and those who criticize you because they want to, want to see you fail. And I think that's the major obstacle that the Affordable Care Act faces today, is there's so much opposition for political reasons alone to see that this things fail. Mr. Roy, the more than 95 percent of businesses uh, are small businesses. They got fewer than 50 employees that would not be subject to this mandate. You agree with me so far? Uh, not subject to this mandate is not a static term because businesses grow and Do you agree with me or disagree with me? I disagree with you. Good. An approximate 200,000 large businesses with more than 50 employees are subject to the employer responsibility requirement. Of these 200,000 larger employees, at least 95 percent already offer health insurance to their employees. Do you agree with that statement, Mr. Joust? Yes. You agree. Do you agree with that, Mr. Joust? I do agree, but as I mentioned, that doesn't mean that all those employees are covered. And what do you mean by that? 95 percent or 97 percent of businesses, as I mentioned in my uh, remarks, 97 percent of businesses with greater than 50 or more employees do offer health benefits, but not necessarily to all employees. A significant number of the uninsured are actually people who are employed by those Mr. firms. Huge tax subsidies that are already there, which was mentioned by Mr. Capretta and Mr. Roy. Yes. Uh, if we wanted to uh, get, have the largest tax increase in American history by abolishing the, uh, the employer tax uh, deductions and exclusions, we could talk about that. I'm not sure that many members in this committee want to do that. I would. Uh, Mr. Roy, do you agree with Mr. Joust? Uh, I do agree that it would be desirable to move away from an employer-sponsored system to an individually-sponsored system. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The courtesy that you extended in allowing me to participate at these very, very important hearings. Congress. Now, it's my basic understanding that with the exception of Mr. Joltz, the other four witnesses support repeal. So there ain't no sunshine pushes there. Uh, you, you believe we ought to get rid of this. And I assume out of the four, with the exception of Mr. Falk, right now none of you have a small business. You don't make payrolls and you don't have responsibility for health care and pension benefits for anybody. Is that correct? And I would assume further that you're not just volunteering your thoughts. The three of you are experts in what you do, unlike Mr. Falk, and you get paid for what you do, the same way doctors and lawyers get paid. Uh, uh, calling you lobbyists would not be a stigma. It would be just an, a label as to what your business is. Am I correct in that assumption, Dr. Roy? 
No, I'm, I'm not a lobbyist. I'm a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, which is a nonpartisan policy research institute, where I have actually uh, articulated alternatives to the Affordable Care Act that so would you provide don't get you any universal coverage. No, no, you're extremely qualified in research, and I've read that. But you don't get paid to take a position. Uh, in other words, you would not be here, your firm or the research outfit, if you were supporting or trying to improve the health care. You're here basically. Your income is based on the fact that that is your professional position. I mean, you're not a doctor. I, 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 I would, I would strongly, strongly disagree with you. I've articulated. Don't disagree. Just say well, what yeah, it is. So I, I've, my positions I'm are asking. All on, my positions are all on the record. I write them every day on the Internet. I've not only advocated approaches. I'm asking appeal. you whether you get paid for advocating your position. That's all. I don't doubt I, that you are professional with I, it. I don't get paid to advocate any particular position. I, well, when you were working for the person that was running for president, did you get paid for advocating a health position with him? No, Romney? I did not. You, you're a volunteer professional. I volunteered for the Romney campaign, yes. But, I mean, in, in the positions that you take on health care, you don't get compensated for I don't that. get compensated for taking any particular position on any particular piece of legislation. So what you're doing is volunteer contribution you're making to help us on the committee and others to understand your position. You're not a doctor, but you do have a professional position, right? I have articulated my view about the Affordable Care Act. And I've you've done, done so it eloquently. Today. So if Thank we you. Repeal, all, all time has expired, uh, Mr. Rangel. Could I just ask one concluding question, Mr. If, Chairman? Uh, perhaps we can follow up or we could submit it in you, writing. That means that I cannot ask her. <laughs> that would be the correct <laughs> assumption. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd also like for the record to point out your qualifications, none of yours, are in question today. You may have different views and different beliefs, but you're here because you care about the issue, you're experts in the issue, you're impacted by the issue. And on behalf of the committee, we're pleased you're here with us today. And I um, want to join with the chairman in his observation. Thank you. Mr. Gerlach. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, Mr. Roy and Mr. Capretta, uh, a macro question, if, if we can. We haven't talked too much about this during this hearing. But since the enactment of Obamacare to this point, when this uh, employer mandate has been temporarily suspended for a year, what do you think the overall impact of the enactment has had on GDP growth relative, and, and also add in uh, Mr. Dennis as well for NFIB, what, what's your thought on the impact of the slow growth we've had in the GDP over the past few years relative to the implementation or the uh, proposed implementation of this enactment? What impact has it had on the decisions of our business, our job creators, uh, relative to the decisions to hire and expand? What we have seen is a, a substantial shift from full-time employment to part-time employment. So we have record high numbers of people who are part-time workers and lower and lower numbers of full-time workers. And that is a transition I would expect to continue as, as, as small and, and medium-sized employers wrestle with the employer mandate, another reason why it would be a great policy to repeal the employer mandate. Mr. Roy, I want to uh, touch on the, the, the point that you were making about part-time workers. I've had employers in my community tell me they're decreasing the number of full-time workers to part-time workers because of this law. In fact, a 322,000 increase in part-time workers, uh, um, involuntary part-time workers to 8.2 million in June. Can you describe the consequences that are happening in the real world bringing about increasing part-time workers and how destructive that is to jobs? You know, we, we've heard a lot of uh, talk today about what, it, what the right thing to do is or what employers should do if they care. Uh, we haven't heard a lot about what the incentives are. And the incentives are very clear with the employer mandate. It's to restructure to part-time workers because then you don't have to offer coverage to those part-time workers. That is just the plainest day uh, economic incentive in this law, and that is what will drive All time activity has by expired. employers. Thank you, Mr. Roy. Thank you. I had a pharmacist. I walked in the other day. His bill came in 27 percent increase. He negotiated out 12 percent. The employees are kicking in more. The, co the coverage isn't quite as good, so they get it down to about 12 percent. But that is the reality. This is doing nothing to bend the cost on health care in the last three years, even though it was supposed to come down 25 percent. Mr. Roy, I want to go to your point, uh, one point that you made, because that's what I see in our area, and that's the uncertainty that people are feeling about not expanding, not growing, not creating jobs. But you said that health care costs already has or is going to double or triple 
Is that what you said, or how did you say how health care costs are going up substantially? And then give me a little more background on where you're getting your information from. Uh, well, health care co the cost of health insurance is increasing for everyone, but it's going to particularly increase for people who shop for and encourage for themselves, the so-called individual or non-group market. That's where the Affordable Care Act's heavy regulation of the individual insurance market will drive up the cost of insurance plans in that market by uh, by two to three times for some uh, workers. And on an average, it seems like it's So you're saying a worker 16. might pay what now, uh, based on your numbers, and what are they going to pay in, the, in, the, in the somewhat the future? So, for example, in the state of California, where I've done extensive research, uh, the average increase for unsubsidized uh, individuals shopping for encourage in the, uh, insurance in the non-group market will increase by a, about 70%. Yeah, that's what I'm hearing. Mr. Mr. Roy, maybe you can... Gentlemen, there's so much uncertainty with this. Absolutely. This is what makes it difficult. And we don't know tomorrow. What's the next shoe to drop? What else are they going to hold back on? <clears throat> Yeah, so it's, it's not just that there's regulatory uncertainty because the law makes so many dramatic changes to the way employers deliver health insurance. It's also that the regulations have been coming out piece by piece and contradicting each other. So, for example, and this is not even about small businesses, it's about states. The states that have been trying to roll out these exchanges, I mean, usually Democratic states, right? So these Democratic states, these exchange directors are saying, you know, we, we design the exchange, we build the exchange, and then HHS comes along and completely changes all the regulations about how the exchange must be designed, and we have to go back and start over and rebuild our systems from scratch. And that happened so many times over the last 12 to 24 months that at a certain point, a lot of these state exchange directors said, we give up. We're going to ignore HHS and just set up the exchange, because if we don't, we won't meet the October 1 deadline to get the exchange going. So it's not merely that the, the laws is poorly designed and that businesses are facing this. Individuals are facing this. State governments are facing this. The regulatory uncertainty, because the law is so complex and so difficult to administer, and the employer mandate is, is Exhibit A. I would like to thank our witnesses for their testimony today. This has been an eye-opening discussion. Clearly, we need to get real answers also from the Treasury Department, and we will do so next week. As a reminder, any member wishing to submit a question for the record will have 14 days to do so. Any questions to submit, I'd ask the witnesses respond in a timely manner, which I know you will. Uh, with that, thank you again. The subcommittee is adjourned.